In every Harry Potter film, there's a new professor, and the filmmakers have hoovered up some of Britain's finest acting talent in casting them. Now, I've come down today to meet Professor Slughorn, who's Hogwarts' new potions master, and I've been told to hang around here. Oh, sorry. I didn't see you there. Professor Slughorn is someone who, years ago, was the potions master at Hogwarts and is the person that Dumbledore recruits this year to come back, not only to teach potions, because, but also because Dumbledore thinks that Slughorn has information on Voldemort that he is too ashamed to admit to knowing. And Dumbledore sort of uses Harry as bait in a way, because Slughorn's obsessed with the idea of fame and power. And so Harry is sort of the most famous, certainly young kind of wizard of his time, um, is the perfect sort of ploy to get Slughorn back to Hogwarts, because Slughorn would want to be around someone like Harry. And Slughorn makes an unusual first appearance in the film. Dumbledore and Harry come into this house that has obviously been ransacked, and there is a purple striped armchair, and uh, Dumbledore performs a bit of magic, and out of that armchair evolves Horace Slughorn, who has disguised himself as an armchair. So there's a bit of special effects. In lavender off. purple pyjamas. In lavender, in the same material as the armchair. It's a very good entrance to a film. Merlin's beard! No need to disfigure me, Elvis. So how do you get a chair to turn into an actor? Working with an actor like Jim Broadbent, uh, you know, it just seemed the logical thing to let him drive the performance rather than come up with a slightly cartoony sort of caricature in terms of a chair. Here's a m mega million dollar Hollywood movie and we basically put him on a plank of wood <laughs> and sit him on this plank of wood. Well, it's a little bit more elaborate than a plank of wood. Um, but it's kind of a plank it's of a wood. It's a shiny plank of wood. It's a shiny plank of wood with two guys operating <laughs> it. And it sort of springs him up. I just said to Jim, Jim, you know what? Imagine you're a chair and then you're turning out of a chair and you have to shake all this fabric off. And he did this rather eccentric, crazy, quite funny acting transformation from a chair to a human, all in a performance. And of course, that was great because from there, using our designs of what we wanted the chair to look like, we then started animating on top, you know, rotoscoping his performance, then looking at how the, the actual chair itself would shrink and come back into his true proportions. And just working off him seems to suggest that actually using cloth as an interesting technique would be quite a good way of resolving the chair and turning the fabric of the chair itself into the pyjamas that he was wearing. Creating a visual effect is a process which involves filtering ideas from many different departments into one end result. Sometimes you start off with some particular view in mind, but by the time you get to the end, it's gone through many iterations and turns out to be something quite different because you've either discovered something new en route or you've discovered something that you thought would work, it doesn't work, and it's not very comfortable, it's not very funny, or it, it's just, it looks like a visual effect. Um, and so uh, it's a, it is a very subjective um, journey that we take. Horace's weakness is that he has a sort of softness for stars. You recognise Barnabas Cuff, of course, editor of the Daily Prophet. He will uh, do anything to get some star names under his, into his, uh, under his wing. He likes collecting them, doesn't he? Yeah, he likes collecting them. So it doesn't take much attempting to come back in a way. All right, I'll do it. But I want Professor Merrithought's old office, not the water closet I had before. And I expect a raise. These are mad times we live in, mad. They are indeed. And it's not just mad times in the wizarding world. There's panic on the streets of London as Voldemort's soldiers, the Death Eaters, attack the Millennium Bridge. Even the makers of Harry Potter don't have the budget to destroy the bridge for real, so they sent a team down there to film images that would later be incorporated into this extraordinary sequence. During the actual destruction of the bridge, obviously we start replacing more and more of the real elements, so we have to take the real bridge out and replace it with the CG bridge. We've actually replaced the Thames as well with CG water so that we get all of the real interaction between the bridge collapsing into the water and the splashes and things. And of course, ultimately at the end, we've actually replaced all the people on the bridge with CG characters running away from the destruction. just under 1,500 special effects in the film, and constant developments in the processes used have enabled the filmmakers to pursue ever more ambitious results. 
I think Quidditch, for example, is in this film uh, better realized than I think we've ever had it. I think it feels more real than ever before. Technology's improved. I think our, our um, knowledge of visual effects has improved. Uh, and I just think it feels really, really real. But how they film Quidditch before it actually hits the technology is still a closely guarded secret. Or is it? Basically, it's no main secret other than for a man. If you um, imagine sitting on a bicycle and taking your feet off the pedals and off the ground and just hanging there and then leaning forward and with all the repercussions that has, um, then you, yeah, then you what, get what, a what are you getting idea. at? Well, it's, it, it, balance well, is difficult. Balance is very, very difficult and also certain very, very important organs are crushed. Ah, comfort. And yeah, so it's the comfort levels are not high. This is Ron's first outing in the Quidditch arena and he eventually emerges as quite a star. I've always fancied sort of having a go on a broom. Yeah. Being a hero. Yeah. But, um, yeah, I mean, it was a bit of a anticlimax when I first sat down. Because it's quite, I mean, it's quite painful for one. It's because you are actually just sitting on a broom. And it does, when you're up there for a few hours, it's, it's quite, it does quite get a bit painful. And, um, but no, it's, it's going to look really cool. Davey wanted a, a comedy aspect to this one, so we had to come up with different gags, different ideas of flying and, and different falls, you know, to, for comedy falls. And you know Quidditch when they're flying up there and obviously on these rigs uh, at, at the Quidditch arena, we've had to come up, we've come up with a, a Russian swing that we've been using and launching them off that. So what, what on earth is a, a Russian swing? A Russian swing is just a great big swing, uh, which you swing back on the falls and on, on the number three, we, the guys just launch, I mean, we can get them up there. On, on that, you know, but we had a big one made for Quidditch for inside, and we had a smaller one made for out here just to launch them off and let them skid across. So the you mode. swing them back because it was one, two, two three, off you gone. go, let yeah. them go. Yeah. 58 feet was the furthest we uh, <laughs> <laughs> launched one of them with a broomstick. This sort of action is strictly left to the stunt team. For the actors, Quidditch training is somewhat less dramatic. I'm going to be given a chance to get out and do some um, stunt training with mm. Greg on the trampoline. Right. Have you any advice for me? I had to do yeah, I had to do that for about a few weeks before we I was allowed on a broom. Seriously? Yeah. You have to master all these different sort of jumps, like tuck jump. That's like jumping and bringing your knees up. Yeah. My four year old cousin can do that. <laughs> it can just get harder because they put you in this harness. Right. And you're on these like bungee springs. Okay. I don't know if you're gonna be doing that, but Ooh. that is that is quite scary. You go really high. You go you go about 30 foot in the air. Whoa! And you, I don't know if you'd be holding up, because I was holding a broom and they were throwing balls at me and I had to sort of <laughs> save all these. It's quite, it's quite scary. Hey, three. I didn't really enjoy that part. <laughs> <laughs> Good luck, anyway. <laughs> I'm going to get to need it. I understand this is where the Quidditch training takes place. Uh, it starts here. It starts here? It, it starts here. We get all the kids in. And we basically just play with him on the trampoline, on the floor, in the gym, just to get, him, to get some movement and some timing. And these, these are obviously the equivalent of the quaffle or...? Correct, yeah. The, just a softer version for this, just in case it catches you in the face. Isn't it? So, look, you've got a harness up there as well. What's yeah, that? this is what we start, everyone, uh, all the uh, people who've been playing Quidditch, we start them in that just to get them bouncing up and down so they're safe. If they make a mistake, we can just hold them off the tramp. Excellent. Dave, just come, come down, we'll take, take your shoes off and we'll put you up in the harness. <laughs> this is good. It's good. ringing the bells. That's it, good. <laughs> Trying to catch him on the nose. <laughs> Which I'll do quite it's often. not the nose I'm worried about, Greg. Watch your nose this time. Here it comes. <laughs> it's going to take a lot more than practice to get me matched.